Welcome. My name is Jonathan Carden, and I'm the director of Major Gifts here at Patrick Henry College, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Uh, Dr. Marvin Alasky, who most of you know, is the editor-in-chief of World Magazine and a prolific author. He has written over 20 books, including Turning Point, A Christian Worldview Declaration, The Tragedy, and The Tragedy of American Compassion. He is the Dean of World, Jo World Journalism Institute and a senior fellow of the Acton Institute. He, deserve, he serves as the Distinguished Professor of Journalism and Public Policy here at Patrick Henry College and is married to PhD's Assistant Professor of Public Policy and Writer-in-Residence, Susan Alasky. And the couple lives in Asheville, North Carolina, although they happen to be here quite a bit, which we're happy about. And today, Dr. Alasky will be interviewing Nancy Piercy. Nancy Piercy is an author, scholar, and evangelist. In the early 1970s, she studied violin in Heidelberg as an agnostic. After converting to Christianity, she traveled to Switzerland to study the Christian worldview at La Brie Fellowship under Francis Schaeffer. She has since earned a BA from Iowa State University and an MA from Covenant Theological Seminary and pursued graduate work in history of philosophy at the Institute for Christian Studies in Toronto. From 1977 to 1990, she wrote articles for the Bible Science Newsletter that analyzed Christian worldview themes, themes she would later develop in her books. She is best known for her book, Total Truth, which received the ECPA Gold Medallion Award for Best Book on Christianity and Society in 2005. In 1991, Nancy became the founding editor of the national radio program Breakpoint with an estimated weekly audience of 5 million. She has also made a name for herself as a Christian writer in a variety of news sources from the Washington Post to World Magazine. She has also served as the Francis A. Schaeffer Scholar at the World Journalism Institute and was the Policy Director and Senior Fellow of the Wilberforce Forum, among many other aspirations. She is currently a professor at the Houston Baptist University and director of the Francis Schaeffer Center for Worldview and Culture, as well as a regular columnist for Christianity Today. Nancy's most recent book is Saving Leonardo, A Call to Resist the Secular Assault on the Mind, Morals, and Meaning. Nancy and her husband live here in Northern Virginia and are homeschooling mm -hmm. the second of their two, soon, two sons. Sorry. Well, please help me welcome them to Patrick Henry College. Thank you. Well, well, Nancy, thank you for coming and thank you all for being here. You are all seekers after truth or at least seekers after a warm spot on a cold day. So I appreciate your being here. And Nancy, you are here in Virginia, but I, just to correct one thing, you no longer live in Virginia. You actually now live in the warm climate, generally, of Houston, Texas. Right. Um, I'm a professor of apologetics and scholar in resi residence at Houston Baptist University. So I, leave, I live in Houston. And you live in Houston, and you've lived in Virginia in the past. And yeah. uh, uh, you went to Iowa State on a music scholarship. Uh, can you tell us about how you achieve that, because I understand you started out with ukulele uh, and then had professional violin training. So tell us a little bit about how you got to that point. Well, my mother was a professional musician, and she made sure all six kids played an instrument. Okay. Uh, and when I was in Germany, uh, I, I studied at the Heidelberg Conservatory. And in many ways, it's, it's, it plays a role today in that um, m most of my writing is cultural apologetics. In other words, showing how Christianity has an impact. Christian truth has an impact on culture. And, and it's a form of apologetics that goes beyond uh, historical, historical arguments for the resurrection or philosophical arguments uh, for the existence of God, and instead looks at how ideas and worldviews permeate a culture through music and through art and literature. And so it was, um, the term cultural apologetics was coined to describe what Francis Schaeffer did, um, because that was very novel at that point. And because of my background in music, that was the kind of apologetics that appealed to me, and uh, I actually became a Christian. After my first visit to Libri, he mentioned, in the introduction, he mentioned my second visit, mm -hmm. but I actually went to Libri as a non-Christian the first time, and it was Francis Schaeffer's cultural apologetics that really spoke to me, and um, eventually I became a Christian, not, not while I was there. <laughs> I, I didn't want to give in to the uh, pressure of becoming a Christian right there. I had to leave and, and think and, and read on my own for a while uh, before I became a Christian, but it was the result of that distinctive approach to apologetics, which we now teach at Houston Baptist University. It is a program in cultural apologetics. And you're teaching about truth, again, as, as was mentioned in the introduction, 
probably your, the book of yours that's won the most awards is, is Total Truth, but you have a new book coming out, I think officially next week, called Finding Truth. Um, how did playing the violin help you to find truth? <laughs> that's an interesting connection. Uh, again, I think um, people tend to think apologetics is for a certain type of person, a certain stereotypical intellectually oriented person, because they think of it in terms of complex arguments and logic. But Francis Schaeffer showed how ideas permeate a culture through art, through literature, through movies and music. And as a result, apologetics appeals to everyone. It, it, it combines the cognitive and the creative. I love it because it appeals to the whole person. And so for creative people who normally don't think they like apologetics, they, they respond very well to uh, cultural apologetics that connects, uh, connects you to the whole person, connects you not just to um, you know, the, an intellectual argument for truth, but shows how your, your truth affects all of your, everything you do. It affects your creative work. It, aff it affects your practical life. And so it has, it's a much broader understanding of apologetics than I think most people normally think of. Well, and sometimes we think of apologetics as uh, pretty high up the ladder of abstraction. You're yeah. just dealing with these great ideas out there. But how do you bring it home to your students when you're starting out at HBU, Houston Baptist University, trying to get them to think about truth and to think, and think about the... The, both the theoretical but also the practical. How do, you, how do you start to make a contact with them in terms of their lives? Well, for many of them it's not that hard because they're, they're having the same kind of questions I had um, before I went to Libri. I, I, gave, I gave up my Christian background when I was in high school and uh, I had a Lutheran background and my, my you know, regular churchgoers and, and so on. Um, but I started having questions that I wasn't rebellious, <laughs> you know, the standard, the standard idea is, mm. you know, you just wanted to party. Um, your, but, your rebellion uh, was perhaps going to the library and pulling <laughs> books off the shelf. That's right, you, that's, that's right. you remember my, uh, the, the, my testimony. I often talk about how um, I started asking questions. I just wanted to know, is it true? How do we know that Christianity is true? That was my one question, but none of the adults in my life could answer it. Um, my, I, I talked to a Christian professor who just said, uh, well, it works for me. I thought, that's not a very profound reason. I even talked to a seminary dean who said to me, don't worry, we all have questions sometimes. <laughs> Take, so it was a take two, read two pages and see in the morning and solve the doctor's <laughs> prescription. Yeah, yeah or, or you know, it's a, it's a psychological phase, you'll pass out of it. <laughs> so when I couldn't get answers to the, just the basic question of how do I know that it's true, um, I, I, it, I really thought of it as a matter of intellectual honesty. I thought if you don't have good reasons for something, you can't really say you believe it. And so I very intentionally put aside my Christian upbringing and embarked on a search for truth. I wanted to lay it alongside the other religions and philosophies that are out there and make some kind of objective decision which one was really true. And that's when I went to, I was going to a public high school and I literally walked down to the public, down the hallway to the library and started pulling books off the philosophy shelf because I thought if, if Christians can't answer my questions, maybe the philosophers do because don't they talk about questions like what is truth? and what is the foundation for ethics. You know? And, it, and it's, a, it's a low level abstraction because I wanted, to, how do I know that my choices matter? So it wasn't just an academic study. Yeah. The choices I make, are they going to mean anything you know, for, for eternity? Is there a purpose to life or are we just on a rock flying through space? I think because I'd had a strong Christian background, when I gave it up, it, it really hit hard. I understood immediately there's no purpose to life, there's no foundation for ethics, uh, there's uh, not even a foundation for knowledge. How do I know that the ideas in my head have any correlation with what's out there? So I even fell into skepticism, moral relativism. I was the one in my high school arguing there's no right or wrong. And so that when, by the time I went to Labrie, I had, even though it was um, 
I started in high school and I went to Libri when I was in, in college, I had slid all the way down into relativism, skepticism, determinism. I didn't think we had such a thing as free will. But see, my students are asking those questions too. I was asking those in high school. And many of my students are already asking those questions too. So when you went to Libri, did you go there intentionally seeking or, or because I've, I've, I've talked to, I have one friend who uh, was kind of bumming around Europe and met a couple of cute girls and they said, oh, there's this, there's this weird place up in, up in the mountains in Switzerland, but they'll, they'll give you a bed and three meals a day, which is, the insight, which is the inducement that he needed. What brought you there? I was going to school in Germany because I had lived there as a child and I went back. To, and um, when Francis Schaeffer's books first came out, uh, there began to be a, a, a change in the people who came there. There was a kind of phenomenon of uh, Christian tourists who would say, oh, let's go see what Libri is doing. And I have to confess, my parents were among the first Christian tourists. Mm -hmm. My dad was teaching in Ankara, Turkey, right before the military coup. And the, um, the government advised him to leave. So they were crossing Europe on their way to the cheap Luxembourg flights. And they said, let's go to Libri. <laughs> and so they asked me to come down and see them because I wouldn't see them otherwise before they went back to the States. So, that's why I went to Libri, to, to visit my family members who were there for two days. And I had no intention of going to Libri as Libri, you know, as a Christian place to, uh, to, to hammer out you know, was Christianity true. But it was very clear from the questions I was asking that I was not a Christian. And so for, for the Libri staff, that was an appeal. You're not a Christian, let's talk. <laughs> you know, so they invited me to stay. Back then it was, very, um, it, it was very loosely organized. If they had a free bed, they'd say, why don't you stay? So that's what happened. They said, why don't you stay? And the first time I was there, I only stayed a month. Um, uh, because it was, I had never seen this form of Christianity before. I'd never encountered Christians who could engage with the intellectual world, who could engage with the cultural world. They were very art, you know, supportive of the arts and music. Uh, and the, the community at Libri was very attractive. I'd never seen, I, I'd never seen that quality of love and community before. You, you know, in my family, in my churches, and so on. It was very appealing. And I was afraid I might make a decision based on that emotional appeal. And I was not going to do that. I, I, if I was going to take a step towards, back towards Christianity, which I did not want to do, it would have to be because I was completely convinced that it was true. And, so and I, you didn't want to do it because you figured this was really going to leave you uh, not with the cool crowd at all? You, 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 what, why, why, was it the thought, why was the thought of going to Christianity something that you just wanted to rebel against? Like I said, I had never seen this form of Christianity. So what okay. I'd grown up with was a very cold, dry, uh, Scandinavian Lutheran. <laughs> so, some of you are familiar with this. Uh, it's, it's a little like you're, you're Lutheran because you're Scandinavian, just like you're Catholic if you're Irish um, or Italian. When it's, a cultural, um, when it's a cultural phenomenon, a lot of people are not, uh, do not have a strong personal commitment. You know, they're relying on the cultural identity, the ethnic identity, to keep you in the church. And I think that's one reason there, was, there wasn't apologetics. There wasn't engagement with the, with the secular world in any way. There was, um, and it's, liturg it's a liturgical formal church, so even the worship is very cold and dry, and the, it's all about the cognitive ascent to doctrines. So the form of Christianity I'd known was anti-intellectual, anti-cultural, you know, cold and impersonal. It, there was nothing appealing about it. And Libri was the exact opposite. It's, it's so frankly, uh, after a month I fled. I left because I was afraid I might make a decision for less than, out of less than genuine conviction. But by then I had discovered, through Libri I had discovered apologetics. You know, I discovered C.S. Lewis, I discovered other apologetics writers. And I went home and continued reading them and became a Christian on my own. I wasn't in a church. I had no Christian friends. I was just through my reading. I decided I was intellectually convinced. You know, that God had won the argument is how I thought of it. And then I said, where do I find other, other Christians? Well, I knew some at Labrie. So a year and a half later, hmm. I went back and that's where I really got grounded in my understanding of a Christian worldview and, and, and the more personal, practical side of being a Christian. So how would students today have an experience like that? Uh, 
where, where are the Labris of our time? I know Labris still exists, but beyond that, uh, when students go to, go to a Christian college, would they have an experience of the type you had there? Or were, were the questions really being discussed as opposed to just taking this course and this course and this course? Well, some people do. Um, you know, I teach at HBU, HBU now, and there are students who convert to Christianity. Uh, HBU, at HBU, you, you do not have to sign a statement of faith. And so we get a lot of non-Christian students, and many of them do convert, and they, they, they have never encountered Christianity before. Um, but sadly, not always. The, my new book, Finding Truth, uh, the opening anecdote is uh, a young man who went to a Christian college and lost his faith. I was speaking on Capitol Hill one day. Uh, um, it was actually when Total Truth came out, and we did a book launch on Capitol Hill, and after to, to Hill staffers. And after I was finished with my presentation, a chief of staff stood up and said, to the, everyone in the room said, I lost my faith at an evangelical college. <laughs> everyone was <laughs> in shock. So of course I had to ask him his story. And he'd gone to a Christian college, but uh, most of his professors, they taught what was in the, the mainstream textbooks, but the, the dominant theories today are, are secular and sometimes explicitly anti-Christian. And the professors at this uh, university did not offer an altern a biblical alternative. He even pursued them you know, in their office hours in, the, at, in their offices and said, how do you relate your theological convictions to what you teach in the classroom, to your professional discipline? And he said not one of them could give an answer. And so he decided eventually that Christianity had no answers, and he, and he gave it up. Um, and in, in my new book, I cite, uh, in say, Finding Truth, I cite a survey that was done about five years ago of the CCCU schools, that's the Coalition of Christian Colleges and Universities, and these are the evangelical schools. And in this survey, only about half said that they were confident that they could give a Christian perspective in their field. Half of the professors? Half of the professors said they could give a Christian perspective in their own discipline. So that was pretty surprising. I think most, Christian, most parents, when they send their, kid, their, their children to Christian colleges, expect more than half the professors to give a Christian perspective. So that's what we're up against in Christian higher education is we, to be charitable, most of them go to, they get their higher degrees at, um, the graduate degrees at, at secular graduate schools, where they don't have a realistic opportunity to develop a Christian worldview. In fact, they probably had to fly under the radar screen because if they did express a Christian perspective, they might be penalized. And so they come to teach at a Christian college and they haven't necessarily had the opportunity to really do the, the thinking necessary to work out a Christian perspective. And that's why Christian colleges really have to do um, professional development and faculty training uh, if they really want to make sure that they're teaching a Christian worldview throughout, uh, across the curriculum. So then, to go to the title of your new book, Finding Truth, if a student is at a place where he's really not getting much in the classroom, uh, or if adults are trying to think things through, uh, they're reading the Bible, they're, they're diligent in doing that, uh, is that sufficient for them to find truth? Or, go ahead. No, no, I don't think so. Um, I mean, that's where Christian worldview comes in. It's, Christian worldview is drawing the connection uh, between the Bible and theological truths to what does that mean for philosophy? What does that mean for e economics? What does that mean for education? You know, what does that mean for business? That, the, that building that bridge and expressing truth in the terms of that discipline is largely what we mean by Christian worldview. Um, and the most recent um, tragedy that I ran into was a, a woman came to me and um, I'm, I'm in Texas now, so her, her son had gone off to Texas A&M to study psychology. And of course there too, in psychology, ever since Freud, the dominant view of in, in psychology has been very hostile to Christianity, that Christianity is an infantile regression, you know, that it's a um, projection of the imaginary father figure into the sky because you just can't grow up, you're, you're too immature not to have an imaginary father figure. Um, and he encountered these secular worldviews and had no idea how to respond. So he'd come from a warm Christian family, a good Christian church, but they hadn't taught him how to respond to secular theories 
in the discipline he was studying. He lost his faith in it within a semester. I mean, it, it was just a it just washout, and it's um, it, it's tragic. And it's been what two years now, and he still hasn't he still hasn't recovered. So, what resources would be available to that student, or what's or what resources should that student seek? Go ahead. My new book. <laughs> These are no, some a leading of question, and you have the right <laughs> answer. <laughs> so. Thank you. Uh, it's stories like this that inspired me to write uh, Finding Truth, and it it gives it gives um, a strategy that you can use in any discipline. Uh, and you, uh, see, when I was when I converted to Christianity. I thought to be intellectually responsible as a Christian, I need to have an answer to all of these secular views. But when you, when you think of all the secular theories in every discipline out there, that would take a lifetime. You know, most of us don't have that much time. And, and what happens if you encounter a new view? Do you have to come up with a, a whole new argument? And so I was very excited to discover that uh, I, work, I work off Romans 1 that there's a biblically based strategy that you can apply to any theory in any discipline to cut to the heart of what, of, of what it's saying and to evaluate it using a biblical uh, criterion so, to show that it, you know, where it fails, where it fails to fit reality, where it fails logically. Okay, and uh, I know in the, in the book you, uh, you certainly look at uh, some of the intellectual leaders of, of the past 50 years or so, like Francis Crick, Steven Pinker, and so forth, and, and show that there are contradictions in their own thinking, that they really can't live the way that they profess. Uh, is, that you, is that, the, is that a, a key to, to do this, to see the con their contradictions? Or how do you begin to find truth when you're in a situation that seems like an intellectual desert? Right. Um, well... Uh, it starts with Romans 1, so jog your memory a little. <laughs> Where does Romans 1 start? Uh, Paul, Paul says that we all have evidence for God from the created order, but that we, but what? We suppress that evidence. And how do we suppress it? We suppress it by creating God's substitutes. So if we ex remember the verse that we exchange, the, those who exchange, the, those who don't acknowledge a transcendent creator, will take something in the created order and make it a God substitute. And they will exchange the glory of God for something in creation that becomes then their ultimate reality. And, and you know, when we read that verse, we often think, of course, of statues and golden calves. But of course, an idol can be something abstract as well. I mean, our personal idols might be things like success and relationships, the things we, that many people live for. But it can also be something abstract like matter. Is matter part of the created order? Sure it is. So materialism is, qualifies the biblical definition of an idol. A materialist puts matter as the ultimate reality and redefines everything else in its categories. It's the cause and source of everything else that exists. Can reason be an idol? Sure, right. So the philosophy of rationalism says that reason is the source and standard of all truth. And uh, Einstein actually called himself a believing rationalist because he understood it was a full-blown creed. So th uh, this helps us to see how we can take the biblical categories and apply them to modern isms. The first step is find its idol. What does it put in the place of God as the ultimate, ultimate reality? The atheists will say, I don't have a belief, right? Atheism, and on atheist websites, they'll say, uh, atheism is not a belief, it's just the lack of belief in God or, some, or gods. But of course, everyone starts somewhere. They put something in the place of God. They're usually materialists or naturalists, putting matter or nature in the place of God. Everyone starts somewhere in their thinking. And you press them back far enough and you'll find what they put in the role of God, what functions in the role of God for them. Okay, so you mentioned, for example, a psychology course uh, and of the... Uh, big three of the 19th and early 20th century, Freud, Darwin, and Marx. Freud is still, Mar Marx is largely discarded in many ways. Freud is still around. Uh, how would you deal in a psychology class? How would you apply this gen the general principles you lay out uh, to that particular situation for a student caught in such a class? Right. Once you determine the idol, then um, 
you just you spell out some of the consequences, and some of the consequences are what is the view of the human person? You know, Freud, Marx, and Darwin all, we had, all promoted a certain view of the human person, and what you will find is in, inevitably they will have a lower view of the human person than Christianity. Why? Because if we're made in the image of God, then a non-Christian worldview will recast humans in the image of their idol. In other words, they'll redefine human nature according to something less than God, and therefore it will always be a lower view. So for Freud, um, you know, we're basically biological organisms uh, driven by psych our psychological history and especially the sexual instincts, right? The instincts are what drive us, biological instincts. Uh, for Marx, it's economics. We are essentially driven by economic interests and religion, morality, uh, uh, laws, everything else is all really driven by our desire to, to get ahead financially. <laughs> um, Darwin, of course, evolutionary, evolutionary psychology is a fast-growing movement in the academic world today, applying cr uh, evolutionary categories to uh, all of human life, to our thinking, to our emotional life, to our relationships, and asserting that everything is driven ultimately by survival. Not, we believe things not because they're true, but because they contribute to our survival. So how does this then give a way to test? Um, first, the, the two main tests of any theory, and, and this isn't distinctively Christian, you know, everyone thinks this way, it does it fit the real world and does it hold together internally, logically. So once you figure out it's idle, you can figure out it's low view of the human person, and then you can test it. Uh, does, <laughs> does, do, uh, do you know that people, uh, let, let me back up uh, and, and use some examples that are more sure. obvious than the ones you, that you listed. Hmm. Today, I deal a lot with materialism because that is the dominant worldview in the academic world today. And it's amazing how many materialists today have worked out their views to the point where they recognize and they admit that it doesn't fit the real world. So, um, we, at lunch we were talking about Rodney Brooks. Rodney Brooks is a professor emeritus at MIT. Uh, used to be the head of the artificial intelligence department. Uh, in his book, Flesh and Mach it's called Flesh and Machines, he says, human beings are a, human, a human being is just a big bag of skin full of biomolecules interacting by the laws of physics and chemistry. Okay, so that's his low view of the human person, right? He's a materialist, his idol is matter, his low view of the human person is you're basically a complex biochemical machine. Let's test that. Can Rodney Brooks live with that? No, in the next passage he says, when I, well, he says, I, I, I realize it's hard to really see people this way, he says. You know, when I look at my children, when I, try, when I really try, I can see that they're machines. And then he says, is that how I treat them? Of course not. I don't treat them like machines. I give them my unconditional love. And then he says, the furthest you could get from rational analysis. See, if rationality is defined by a materialist worldview, then it is irrational to love your own children. So he is admitting that his own worldview is too small. It, it think of a worldview like as trying to stuff all of reality into a box. So the materialist worldview says everything has to fit in the box of matter. And then Rodney Brooks discovers some things don't fit, like my love for my kids doesn't fit in my box. So what does he do with that? He says, I hold two sets of inconsistent beliefs. That's a direct quote. I hold two sets of inconsistent beliefs. He recognizes his worldview is too small to fit his own experience. Now you and I looking at that would say, Shh, doesn't this falsify your worldview? If your box is too small, aren't you admitting that your categories are too small to explain all of reality? So this is how one way you test a worldview, you take it into the world and see if it fits. And it's amazing, Rodney Brooks is only one of the many that I quote in Finding Truth, that of people who are acknowledging that their worldview doesn't fit the world, real world. Uh, another one is, uh, another one is mm -hmm. Edward Slingerland. Um, he's uh, writing from the perspective of the, of the humanities. He's trying to tell the arts, he's trying to tell the arts and, and literature folks, you know, the creative types, that they need to uh, line up their thinking with the latest science. And, and so he, he says, um, he calls himself a proud evolutionist and materialist. And he makes the case that there's no such thing as free will, 
There were complex machines. There's um, no moral responsibility. And that, you know, we're just, as jo Dawkins says, we're gene machines. You know, genes produce us in order to get the genes into the next generation. You know, survival. And then he says, the thought of my daughter as merely a, a, ro a robot program to get her genes and our genes to the next generation st strikes me as bizarre and repugnant. He said that this view uh, inspires, inspires in us a sort of revulsion. These are his, his actual words. And then he says, if you don't feel that revulsion, something's wrong with you. He said, there, are, there may be people who can look at other people in these mechanistic terms as complex machines, but we label such people psychopaths and lock them up to protect the rest of us. Right, but, but an evolutionist would say that, in fact, for Rodney Brooks to feel love for his daughter makes enormous sense, even though it's illogical in terms of the genetic imperative makes lots of sense because that will lead him to be more protective to his daughter, thus his genes will uh, advance through the, through the millennia. So uh, Darwinism seems to have an answer to this question, namely, Yes, it's irrational. Yes, it doesn't make any sense, but it does help us in the struggle for survival and the struggle to pass along our genes to the next generation. Well, it's interesting that um, many of the thinkers don't, don't take that step. I mean, Slingerland, like Rodney Brooks, also says, um, you ha he, his word is, you have to develop a dual consciousness. Mm -hmm. We must see people as, as physical systems and persons. And so essentially, uh, it, it's, it's what Francis Schaeffer described as the upper lower story, you know, right. and he, Schaeffer, if you've read some of Schaeffer's or, or my books, you've seen the little diagram with the line and uh, what materialists say is, is real and true is their lower story, the role of facts and uh, what we can uh, determine scientifically and empirically and verify. And then they have an upper story where they put these things that they can't deny in their personal experience, their love for the children, free will, consciousness, but which don't fit in their box. And so they create sort of an upper story of necessary falsehoods. As, um, as Marvin Minsky at MIT puts it, these are things that we can't not believe, and yet we know they're false, according to our worldview. And so they have this sort of ambiguous upper story where they they can uh, es essentially take it out when they need it. <laughs> when I'm loving my children, I acknowledge the upper story, but when I'm working as a professional uh, in my field, I deny that it's real. Steven Pinker, you mentioned his name, actually said, when I'm in the laboratory, I treat people as complex data processing machines. But when I take my lab coat off and go home for the day, I treat people as uh, dignified, rational human beings. Right. So the, it, we talk about Christians being compartmentalized. The secular people are incredibly compartmentalized because their worldview doesn't fit the real world. And so they have to essentially jump between the upper and lower stories um, to, to live their life. Right, but in a sense, that would be an evolutionary advantage. <laughs> if, they, if they were consistent, then they would just, when they were hungry, they would just eat their children. Uh, but they don't want to do that. And so they, they, they pass on their genes for, for, for the generations. So I guess what I'm wondering is the... Um, uh, you know, Marxism seems pretty much defunct in many ways, uh, except at some American universities. Yes. Um, the Freudianism is passe somewhat. Darwinism seems stronger than ever. Uh, and, and how do you fight that? And, or let me, let, me, let me bring it down a little bit. Uh, if you were running for president, and I will be glad to nominate you, uh, if you were running for president uh, and you were asked the question that Scott Walker was asked in London about evolution, what would you say? If I was asked if I believed in evolution, I think the, an effective answer would be, sure I do, depending on what you mean by evolution. Okay. Most textbooks define it as change over time. Who doesn't believe living things change over time? The disagreements come in over what is the cause of that change. And there are many people who doubt that natural selection, you know, that the known, the, you know, the, the the uh, mainstream science accepts uh, natural processes like natural selection. A lot of people dis uh, disagree with whether natural selection is the main cause of change. And so in, in the schools, we should 
of course, you should teach the dominant view because everyone should know it. But you should also teach the disagreements and, and the scientific reasons for those disagreements, you know, the pros and cons, the scientific evidence for and against, and teach critical thinking so the, the students can make critical judgments. Because it's, you know, where, where the scientific advance often comes from are the, the views that are not mainstream yet. And so we, we definitely want to keep, uh, you know, to, to, to teach, um, to, to be liberal, to be truly liberal would be to teach all of the, uh, all of the potential answers so that students can think critically. But if you do throw some doubt on Darwinism, on material Darwinism, materialist Darwinism, then you are considered stupid. Uh, students don't want to be there, especially teenagers and, and people even older. How do you, how do you fight that? Right. Well, um, let's go back to uh, when I was saying you test things by the internal consistency okay. as well as by the external. Um, Darwinism falls apart internally. Uh, again, um, it's in, um, in, in apologetics or among philosophers, it's a common argument to show that things can self-destruct, that they self-refute. Um, for example, well, the, the most obvious examples you've probably heard of are people who say um, there is no absolute truth. Oh, is that statement absolutely true? Yeah. Or we can't, you know, we, the skeptic who says we can't know anything for sure. Do you know that for sure? So in these cases, you're taking the person's own statement and turning it back on itself and showing that it deconstructs. Um, that's a valid tool in, in philosophy, and it's, it, the, the technical term is self-referential absurdity. But one apologist called, says, this is how a world you commit suicide, which, which, is, uh, which my students like a lot better as a term. <laughs> you know, as you, its categories are applied back to itself, it self-destructs. So evolutionary psychology um, has given rise to evolutionary epistemology, which is your view of truth your definition of truth. And evolutionary epistemology says we, you know, the ideas arise in our mind not because they're true or false, but because of the neurons firing in our brain, and they're selected for by natural selection if they help us to survive. They're selected for their, tr not their truth value, but their survival value. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what about that view? It, it, was it select, is it because, do you hold it because it's true or because it's survival value? There's a philosopher today, a British philosopher, who literally says in one sentence, um, because, uh, since, because of Darwinism, ideas are not, are not true but useful. If that is true, <laughs> and he doesn't even catch himself, <laughs> he's just said, there is no, according to Darwinism, ideas are not true, they're only useful. If that's true, <laughs> Uh, he's, he's undercut himself. So the, one of the most powerful arguments against Darwinism today is you can't even speak of it coherently <laughs> because every statement you make from an evolutionary perspective undercuts itself. There is no truth from an evolutionary perspective and so everyone who makes a statement is committing suicide. So the, 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 five, uh, the, the book has the subtitle, Five Principles. It's Finding Truth, Five Principles for Unmasking Atheism, secularism, and other God substitutes. And so the five principles are, find the idol, find its slow view of the human person. The technical term for that is reductionism. Reductionism means reducing something from a higher level of complexity and value to a lower level of complexity. Like people who say, oh, religion's just an emotional crutch. Love is just a chemical reaction. Uh, that's, those are ex examples of reductionism. Human beings are just complex biochemical machines. These are all forms of reductionism. And you can be certain, this is what's cool about it being based on scripture, you can be certain that every worldview will have an idol that's less than God and therefore will be reductionistic with a lower view of the human person. And then you, you test it against the real world. Because it's reductionistic, some things won't fit in its box. And so you could, there will always be something that contradicts the worldview because its box is too small. If you're building your worldview on a part of creation, a part is always too small to explain the whole. So you can be sure every non-Christian worldview will be too small, something will not fit in the box, and that will serve to falsify it. And then the fourth step is um, show that it deconstructs, that it implodes, that it uh, is self-refuting. 
every worldview will be self-refuting, like the example of evolutionary epistemology. It will come back and, under, and shoot itself in the foot. It will slit its own throat. And why is that? Bec uh, this was widely used in, in philosophical arguments, but nobody ta explains why. The reason is that reductionism. If you have a low view of the human person, you will have a low view of the human cognitive faculties, of uh, the mind, rationality, reason. But how do they support their own view? They can only use, support it by using reason, you know, arguments. So when they uh, discredit reason, they discredit their own view. And so every worldview will end up self, self, uh, being self-refuting. And so this, because these, and then the fifth principle is, is a, the positive argument, make a case for Christianity. And because you've already shown where the secular worldviews fail, you will be most relevant when you build a Christian perspective that answers those questions. For example, take, take the low view of reason. Christianity doesn't have that problem. It doesn't self-destruct because it has a high view of reason. We're made in God's image. We're made in the image of a rational God who created the universe according to a rational order. And he made our minds to cor correspond with that order so we can be confident that what, you know, what's going on in our head essentially does correspond with the external structure of the world. And this is what gave the confidence for the rise of modern science, for example, historically speaking. So Christianity has always given a confidence that human knowledge, that, uh, that we can go out and investigate God's world and gain genuine knowledge. So essentially what's happened then is when a, when a non-Christian is building his case and using reason, he's reaching over and grabbing the Christian view of, of reason. He has to assume the reliability of reason and rationality, at least at the moment when he's building his own case. So he's reaching over and borrowing from Christianity to make his case. And so my uh, final chapter in the book, I show how every non-Christian reaches over and grabs something out of Christianity. And when you build your case on those, on those uh, things that secular people themselves are acknowledging, that they have to borrow from Christianity. Uh, the, the phrase I use is, they're freeloading. And I get that from a secular philosopher named Richard Rorty, uh, who recently passed away, so, the late Richard Rorty. Um, he's, a, he's a committed Darwinist, mm -hmm. um, you know, very, yeah. o very open about that. And then he says, Darwinism does not give a basis for universal human rights. And he wrote, uh, he wrote on political philosophy, so he was very concerned about this. In Darwinism, as, uh, you know, the, the strong win and the weak are left behind. So he acknowledged his own will he did not give a basis for human rights. So what did he say? He said, but I reach over and take that, the idea of universal human rights from, from our Judeo-Christian heritage. Because the idea of human rights historically was completely novel, came only from the idea that we're made in God's image and that all human beings have value in God's eyes. He said, so I'm, a he said, I'm happy to be a freeloading atheist. Yeah, you have a snappy quotation from him. This Jewish and Christian element in our tradition is gratefully invoked by freeloading atheists like myself. So at least he's grateful. <laughs> he's um, in a moment, questions from all of you, and perhaps you could think of a particular area of your interest and ask Nancy to apply her five principles to that. I'm going to ask you, as you're thinking about this, I'm just going to ask uh, the, new, the new kid on the block in many ways in the Darwinist debate uh, in evangelical circles is, is a foundation called BioLogos. And how would you analyze what they're doing and how they're applying uh, biblical understanding to these, the uh, creation versus evolution debate? Um, well, I haven't read all of their books carefully, but my main concern is that historically you can see that when people accept evolution according to the standard atheist Darwinist definition of evolution, it almost always, maybe always, ends up affecting their theology. Mm. It almost always ends up affecting their view of the human person. Generally, they, and um, I mean, you could go through examples and, and show this one by one, but it, it, generally they end up giving up the fall um, and the reality of sin, because after all, according to evolution, we're going this way. <laughs> we're, we, were, we started out as, as basically biological organisms and we're moving upward, we're advancing. Um, and so sin becomes redefined in terms of mm -hmm. 
um, we just not evolved enough. You know, we still have the biological instincts that, that drive us and that we haven't quite transcended yet. So you almost always lose the view of the fall. Well, what happens then? Well, then how do you define salvation? If we're not truly fallen and if our, our sin is often defined in terms of we're just not evolved enough, then is it really a matter of moral evil or is it just um, metaphysical limitation? You know, that we're just not transcended, we haven't transcended to the next step yet. So my concern is they almost always end up, and of course, in denying the reality of Adam and Eve. Uh, that's the big question today. A lot of books are being written on the question, are Adam and Eve historical figures? Um, or are they somehow symbolic of, you know, symbolic of the fact that we all die, we all, excuse me, we all sin. Um, and philosophically, my biggest issue is, <laughs> One of the things that I find most appealing about Christianity and, and found appealing as I was con, you know, thinking through and become, becoming a Christian and to begin with was unique answer to the problem of evil. This all, it, Christianity is the only philosophy that explains why ultimate reality is not the source of evil. You know, that God is not the source of evil or your God's substitute, whatever you put in God's place, is not the source of evil. If evil, if God is the source of evil, then it's intrinsic to the universe and you can't get rid of it. You know, it's intrinsic to who we are. The only way to get rid of evil is to destroy, this, the, to destroy creation and start over. The fact that we can be redeemed and restored implies that it's not intrinsic. The evil is not intrinsic to who we are. And so God can restore us to our original, our original um, condition as human beings. So Christianity alone gives the, the hope that we can be that we can be restored. In other words, that we can, uh, that ultimately we, we will live forever in a new heavens and a new earth, and we can and we will be there. Personal salvation, personal afterlife. If if uh, if, if evil is endemic, then the only way you can have a heaven is to destroy us, and we're, so we're not going to be there. Um, and it, it's the only worldview that gives a basis for fighting evil now. Then. How can you be opposed to evil if it's part of creation? If God created a broken world, then number one, it's intrinsic. How do you fix it? And number two, then God is somehow evil. I mean, it must go back to God himself then. If God created an evil, a broken world, it must go back to God himself. And then there's no hope. Um, Arthur Kussler was a... And Arthur Kussler, who wrote... Um, uh, Darkness at noon. Darkness at noon. Thank you. Um, was he? He was um, a communist who who was disillusioned. Wrote, it was one of the authors of a book called *The God That Failed*. When uh, when they were disillusioned with communism, and then he went to the East. He decided maybe he didn't want to go back to Christianity, so he went to the East, uh, just like so many young people in the '60s did. They went they went to Eastern religions. Being a journalist, he actually traveled to India and Japan looking for an alternative wisdom. And he ended up saying, in pantheism, in pantheism has no answer to the problem of evil because what? It's all part of the whole, the yin and the yang, the good and the evil. It's all part of the whole. You just have to accept it. And he concluded, he became very disillusioned and concluded, if evil is intrinsic to reality, then you end up with moral relativism. You cannot ultimately say, you should be good. <laughs> no, you have to accept both. And he says, it leads to passive complicity with evil. You, in other words, you can't fight evil if evil is intrinsic to the universe, why fight it? And so he ended up coming back to the West and saying, I, I, I've come to appreciate the Western heritage after all. Nobody else has an answer to the problem of evil. So I, to me, that was the biggest thing, mm. the biggest thing at stake with accepting evolution and that God created a broken, fallen world to begin with and we're slowly evolving upward, is that if God created a broken world, then God is ultimately responsible for evil and there's no hope. We've lost the distinctively Christian answer to the problem of evil. Mm. Questions? Um, we're excited to hear about a new book, so we're looking forward to that. Thank you for writing it. Where do you see the most hope in the broader culture? It's easy to get um, discouraged 
when you look at some of the uh, issues being debated at the uh, presidential electoral level, um, so I'm always looking for hope. And your book certainly gives a pathway to that intellectual uh, shining, uh, shining horizon. But where do you see uh, hope and, and uh, positive happenings in the broader culture? I'd love to know. Um, it is true that um, you know, studies show rising, rising percentage of nuns, N-O-N-E, of nuns, of people who have no religious affiliation. It's true that the surveys show that you know, evangelicals uh, are losing their children at, at disturbingly high rates. Um, it's true that a lot of cultural Christians are abandoning ship. I'm glad you're giving us causes for hope here. <laughs> it's true that. <laughs> and my, my uh, right now I can think of off the, off the top of my head, my only ho reason for hope right now is that in the face of all that, those who are truly Christian are becoming much more articulate, much more committed, um, realizing that you can no longer sort of, you can't be a cultural Christian. I just moved to Houston. <laughs> there are a lot more cultural Christians there than, well, I lived in D.C. for 20-some years, and so it's a bit of an adjustment to find. They, there are many people in Houston who are still coasting, <laughs> who still think cultural Christianity is enough, and I, you know, you, you, you're, you're trying to let them know, in the rest of the world, it's, it's not like this. Most of America, you can no longer sit on the fence. You can no longer have one foot in Christianity and one foot in the world and sort of uh, survive that way. And it's, and it's uh, you know, I grew up in a home where Christians, and in my parents' generation, Christians didn't stand out that much from their non-Christian neighbors. Right? You know, the non-Christian neighbors still held, a, you know, the public ethic was still largely Christian. They didn't want their kids smoking, sleeping around, um, and uh, they wanted the kids to get good grades and, and succeed and be nice people and be courteous. And a lot of those, the public ethic, of course, was, we've lost. And so you're, if you're going to be a Christian today, you do stand out from your neighbors. And so if you're not ready for that, you know, it's going to be a smaller number, obviously, but those who stay, uh, you see a lot larger percentage of people saying, if I'm a Christian, I'm going to be a a really committed Christian and know what I believe and why I believe it, be able to articulate and defend it. And so among my students, I, I definitely see that winnowing effect where the ones who are strong Christians are much stronger and much more committed uh, than in previous generations. Is this on? Okay. Thank you very much for coming today. Do you have any tips in specific for interacting with someone with a nihilistic worldview? Sure. Uh, nihilism is not actually a worldview. Just because I have an ism attached doesn't mean it's a worldview. Like determinism is not a worldview. It's a consequence of a materialistic assumption that treats people as machines. And so you determine. Um, you know, reductionism is not, a con is not a worldview. It's a consequence of having a box that's too small. And so you're you know, reducing humans to the box. Nihilism is not a worldview, it's a consequence. So if you're talking to a, a, a person who's a, who appears to be or claims to be a nihilist, you always, you always want to push them back to, where is it coming from? You know, um, <laughs> I was fairly nihilistic when I was a non-Christian, but that's because I'd given up my Christianity and realized what's left if there is no personal God and we really are just on a rock flying through space, through the empty, dark reaches of space, Oh, where is the source of meaning? Where is the source of human dignity? Where is the source of good and evil? I, I mean, I was being logical, working out the logical consequences of that, prime, that first premise. So what you want to do is push people that back and figure out where it's coming from. Where is the first premise? And once they see the consequences of, the, of that premise, the goal is then that they'll rethink the premise. You know, um, if, you, if your worldview leads to uh, consequences that are false, that don't fit the real world, you know, that self-refute, then you should rethink your premise. But it's, it's easy to get caught up in isms and not realize that sometimes those aren't, that's not actually a worldview. Get back to the metaphysical assumptions that led to that. What's their idol, in other words? Go back and find out what their idol is. <laughs>
and that's driving the rest of it. That's why I, I love this, these five principles from Romans 1, because once you've got the idol, you've got the, you figured out the whole rest of their worldview, <laughs> insofar as they're logically consistent. And, and if they're not, then you can give them examples of people who are logically consistent and say, this is what you should be believing. If you don't want to believe that, question your premise, because this is where it leads. And, and, but on the other hand, you don't have to go there. There is a personal God. And a personal God affirms who we are as persons. And suddenly, loving your own children, you know, moral, moral uh, responsibility, human dignity, human rights, universal equality, all of these make sense of the Christian worldview. They follow perfectly logically from your first premise. And so if you don't like these consequences, or you see that they fail, you know, there is an alternative where they do fit. They, Christianity, this is what I, um, I, I think is ironic, is Christians are often accused of being irrational, right? That's, that's one of the charges thrown at us. But right now, as we saw earlier, this non-Christian has a fragmented worldview. They, many of them today are recognizing the box is too small, and loving their own children, or human dignity and human rights don't fit in their box. So they're living with this two-story dualism, and it's not just complementary, like body and soul. In, in, in biblical worldview, body and soul are different, but complementary. But I'm a machine versus I have free will is logically contradictory. <laughs> if you're a machine, you, then free will is impossible. Loving your children is impossible. Robots don't love. And so this is a deep logical contradiction. They are living with a highly fragmented worldview. Over against that, we can, Christianity is logically consistent. Nothing falls out, none of human experience falls outside. It hasn't, its box is big enough to include all of human experience. Everything fits within it. So we are the ones arguing today for unity of truth. What philosophers used, they've kind of given up the phrase, but what, what they used to argue for was unity of truth. The, the universe is a coherent system, so the truth about it should be a coherent system. But today, secular worldviews all have this deeply, you know, this deep dichotomy, this contradiction, whereas Christianity holds together logically and rationally. So we're the ones defending rationality today because our Christianity is a rational and coherent worldview. So, you know, we need to turn the tables on them. Well, let me, but let me ask, if, if we are programmed to reproduce, that's our prime imperative, wouldn't then loving our children so they can grow up and have children and thus be fulfilling our prime imperative. Isn't that a logical thing to do? <laughs> you keep coming back to that. <laughs> um, it's, it, I just, I have not seen that argument made. It's, it, okay. You're right, it's, it sounds like it should be logical. But um, let me give you another example. Okay. That's, um, it, um, What's his first name? Talis. Uh, uh, hmm. I might have to give it to you later. Okay. He has a, a new book out that's getting some attention um, in which he argues that you know, he's, a, he's a, a materialist and an evolutionist, and yet he's worried about the consequences mm -hmm. because uh, neuroscience is now, neuroscience is the main source of reductionism today. You, know, you have neuro law, which is trying to, um, figure out why we have notions of justice by doing MRIs on our brain. You know, neuroesthetics or neuroliterary theory. You know, Neurobaseball. <laughs> I bet they do. Have you seen that? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Neurosports. Yeah. Neuroliterary theory, you know, they put MRIs on your brain and, and track your brain movement as you read Schaefer. Uh, Schaefer. Shakespeare. <laughs> Shakespeare. Um, neuromarketing. You know, put the MRI on you and figure out why you respond to certain brands or images. Uh, neuroethics, you know, why do we think right and wrong? Well, it's just because of the neurons firing in our brain. So it's radically reductionistic, you know, and love, you know, what, what's happening in our brain. It's a reductionism to every area of life is being reduced to neurons firing in your brain. Um, and this book by Ta Talis, uh, it's, Raymond. Raymond, thank you. Raymond Talis um, is very concerned about this reductionism, and yet as a materialist and evolutionist, you know, self-proclaimed, self he has no answer to it. 
And he says, this, neurolog this neurophysical reductionism is, is taking over all these fields. And then he reaches out to Christians and he says, Christians should be joining me. Literally, he says, Christians, you should be joining me in fighting against this reductionism. And he says, I don't believe in God myself. I, mean, I, think, I, I think religion's false. I think it's, you know, silly. But Christians are also against this kind of reductionism. They don't want to see people reduced to neurons firing in their brain. And so he says, you should be joining me in my crusade against this sort of neurophysical reductionism. So, um, to, and so this fits into your question. It fits into our, you know, the broader theme of, hey, he's trying to grab, he's trying to freeload. He's trying to freeload what only Christianity gives. But it's, this is what I'm seeing when I read the literature is most of them are saying, uh, even loving our children is just neurons firing in our brain. And so maybe there is a, an evolutionary survival mechanism that causes these neurons to fi fire, but it's still a radically reductionistic view of the human person. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to have to conclude here, and I appreciate you all coming because you are fighting against a reductionist Patrick Henry College view that your only purpose is to go to classes, read what's there, and thus get good grades. Uh, you are not. You, 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 have, you are better than that. Uh, you have opportunity to, to really learn something from, from people like Nancy, and I hope you'll come the rest of this week. Uh, Joshua Moravchik and John Stone Street and Al Moeller um, um, are great people to learn from. So hope to see you all tomorrow. Right now, please join me in thanking Nancy for coming today. Thank you.